today we have Cece Karski with us. Cece is just completing her dietetic education program and in a few months will be a registered dietitian. She's also a diabetic and so she's agreed to talk with us today about the what she sees as the important role of a dietitian in working with someone who has a chronic disease. Cece, how old were you when you were diagnosed as having diabetes? Um, I was 10 years old, so I've been diabetic for 13 years. Um, I had the classic symptoms of diabetes, urinating a lot, drinking a lot, uh, being tired all the time. I remember particularly looking up a flight of stairs and thinking that it was just kind of like a mountain to get up there. Um, I was, I was, uh, I easily lost control of my emotions, you know, I'd just cry with it, you know, no problem at all. Um, my parents and my teachers kind of noticed that I was losing an awful lot of weight at, at the same time, so that's when I was hauled off to the doctor and they picked up some large blood sugar value and so I was diagnosed. Do you remember what was it like when you came back to school then after, after being away for a few days? Um, it was I, was, I was out 10 days and mm -hmm. I was, um, it wasn't too big of a deal. Um, I didn't, I didn't, uh, <laughs> You mean the, the, the other children didn't yeah, ask they a didn't. lot of questions? No, or? they just wanted to know why I was gone and I just told them I was diabetic and I had to change my eating eating style a little bit and take shots and stuff like that. It was kind of a novel idea. It wasn't, I didn't think about the long-term implications that much at that point. Taking shots, was that, was that troublesome? No, the, the shots weren't a problem. I took one in the morning and one at night. Um, actually, just one in the morning at that time. The snacks in the afternoon gave me a little bit of trouble. I didn't like to pull out my snack and say, I'm diabetic, I have to eat this now. And so that kind of made me a little bit inhibited around other kids. So you're saying that right at the very beginning, it, it wasn't too traumatic. Right, it wasn't. Um, looking back now, what, what would you say was your toughest time? <laughs> um, adolescence was definitely the worst. Um, when, I, when I was in junior high, I started, you know, I started wanting my independence a little bit more. Um, I wanted to eat what my friends were eating, and I definitely had and still have a sweet tooth. And I used to, I used to start, well, back then, about seventh grade, I started eating a lot of cookies and sweets and so on. And um, I started, I started kind of faking my urine tests. Um, I would start, you know, I needed to be testing negative trace one plus two plus and I was starting to test real high because of all those sweets I was eating. So I started just making up the tests. I wrote down what I knew I was supposed to write down. And I just, when I had to go to the doctor, I'd exercise a little bit more or just not eat that day or something like that. So that to the doctor, it looked as if you were in fairly good control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the perfect diabetic that's coming through the door. Yeah, so. um, so when, when was the first time then that you began to realize that maybe something was, that things were not going as well as you wanted to have yourself believe? Well, you know, I, I knew that what I was doing was not a good thing. I was, I was drinking a lot of water to push all that sugar through and um, things definitely got worse from junior high. The worst was uh, probably when I was about 16 years old. I was eating just a good 3,000, 4,000 calories a day and not covering it with insulin like I knew I should have been because I had that basic adolescent <laughs> girl fear of gaining weight. So I would just drink a lot of water to push it all through. Um, I also, when I was about 14, got a complication on my leg, a vascular complication. And it started as a little small red spot and it just over the years started growing. And I knew, and the medical community obviously knew that this was um, because of the poor control and uh, those feelings started you know coming at the same time as my feelings of this is a serious thing and you know I started thinking about the long-term implications of the disease you know all the so sort of stuff. you thought about it and you had some realization as to how serious it, it was 
But did this make any change in, in the number of cookies you ate and how often, <laughs> <laughs> how often no. you had cake or anything? No, because no one really knew. I guess I was kind of a closet eater. And uh, the dietitians who, who wrote up diets for me gave me things like two breads and two vegetables and one fruit. <laughs> You know, I, I looked at it and just kind of laughed inside, thinking, well, I don't like vegetables, so I'm not going to eat those, and I'm going to eat more like five breads or seven breads, and they're not going to be the kind of breads they wanted me to eat. So I, the diets were just um, not helpful at all at that point. You know, I didn't feel like the dietitians or really the doctors knew what I was all about. So did this kind of game playing go on then all through high school or? Um, the worst was at, at about 16 and then I changed schools and that helped. Um, I still had an awful lot of bad eating habits to work on, not to mention um, the exercise discipline. Um, so things were still bad. Well around this time is when the, he, the glycosylated hemoglobin tests came out and I also changed doctors at this point. And that's when things kind of came out of the closet. And um, my doctor and my parents realized that I was doing all the cheating on the urine test, you know, that I was just way higher than all those <laughs> negatives and traces that I was writing down. Um, Give me an example of, of what your glycosylated hemoglobin oh, uh, level was, was like. My first one that they ever took was 16.5, and the normal for for non-diabetics was 8 and what what the medical community wanted for a diabetic was 8 to 10. So I was just, you know, way, way out of sight. And I felt like I did in the pre-diabetic days, you know, tired all the time and kind of bitchy and uh, drinking water all the time. So, so how, did, how did you respond then to this being found out kind of? No, oh, it was... <laughs> Uh, it was the scariest time of my life, I think. I, you know, I wanted people to find out and I wanted help, but at the same time I didn't want them to find out because I kind of felt like a failure. Well, I did feel like a failure and like I had no control. Um, my doctor was supportive, but he wasn't very, he didn't understand what it's like for, a, for an adolescent girl not to be able to eat the way she wants to eat and do the things she wants to do. So, um, you know, things didn't really move along. I started kind of taking a little bit more responsibility myself, you know, being a little better about what I was eating. And my paper route helped with the exercise, but I still had a lot of things to work on. What was your insulin regimen at this time? Were you taking more than, than one dose a day? Or? Yeah, after a couple of after the first couple of years, I changed to a two-shot-a-day regimen, and um, you know, as you know, that that requires real moderate eating and and timed eating, and that just wasn't working for me. Mm -hmm. And now, had you started the uh, blood glucose monitoring at this that, point? Yeah, that came about my senior year in high school or freshman year in college, and uh, that was a that was a new novelty too. It, it did give me a little better control, but I still needed to take the control myself. So um, that gave me the, the end to, to taking more control, but I don't think I utilized it like I should have. Um, okay, so we're through high school now, yeah. and you're off to college. How did, how did that work? <laughs> well, my first year of college, I had had some independence-type experiences before that, so it wasn't totally going <laughs> overboard, but it was hard to go through um, the, caf the food service lines and the residence halls um, and exercise and self-control in your eating when all that food was sitting there in front of you. So that part was real hard. And um, even worse than that were the, the uh, 10 o'clock study breaks where your whole floor goes out and has a big birthday cake or treats or whatever, because I definitely wanted to be part of that. And the drinking was also a problem. The parties, no one had ever told me how I could safely drink beer. They mm -hmm. just really evaded that whole question. And, <laughs> you know, so I had to go out and learn it myself. And, you know, probably took some stupid Sp chances to not eating when I was drinking and things like that. Okay. 
So I think now that you think things are, are turned around, so how did, how did that happen? How did that change begin to take place? Oh, that was, um, that was most of it, well, most of it came from within myself, but then there were dietitians who facilitated it and, um, and doctors too. Um, Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, towards the end of my freshman year, I, I uh, went to the University of Iowa and changed my insulin regimen to multiple injections. And that really worked for me. You know, it, it allowed, they told me kind of indirectly or <laughs> whatever, that it would allow me to do a little bit more cheating. It would just allow me a lot more flexibility in my eating. And that really appealed to me. And so that helped in the control. Um, I would just take larger shots and start covering the food I was eating. It allowed me to eat those 10 o'clock dormy binges and all that. Um, I started, um, well, the, the dietitian there really catered towards my lifestyle. She, you know, I had two different um, meal patterns that I really was following depending on my class schedule and my work schedule. And she was really willing to, to um, set up a meal pattern that was geared towards those two separate um, routines. And, you know, I, on the one hand, I didn't want anyone to find out the way I was eating, but on the other hand, I had a great deal of respect for the woman because she was, you know, she kind of had my number. She, she knew that I was trying to kind of evade the whole diet pattern routine and um, you know having someone come in and tell me what to eat when to eat it and she really was willing to work with that you know to accommodate my lifestyle not what her idea of a good diet for a diabetic mm -hmm. was like mm -hmm. okay did did having this information and this knowledge uh, did that do the trick did that make you uh, change or did it take something more than that to well it you know I would say most of it came from within me, and and um, those people acted as facilitators or whatever, um, you know, helped me along. Um, I just took took small steps, you know. I guess it just goes with growing up. And um, the first thing to change was the was the blood sugar monitoring. I um, just over a week's time in sometime in my junior year, I just started taking. A lot more responsibility for that. I started testing, even though a lot of those tests were in the two and three hundreds. You know, it didn't. You know, I knew that they always had been in in the two and three hundreds, but now I was starting to do something about it. You know, take a shot if it was real high to try to bring it down by morning or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then um, my senior year, when I moved off off campus, that helped as far as the food because I didn't have all those wide open choices. So I started following a lot better of a, of a diet. And at the same time, you know, now I can go back into food service and choose what's right for me. But that just helped kind of getting away from that atmosphere, although I wouldn't change those years. Um, and then the exercise uh, discipline came last. You know, I'm, I never was really good at, I was never athletically inclined, but I was never real good at being of being um, structured with my exercise, doing it every day, and that came about through. And you you are able to do that now. Yeah, okay. yeah, I wouldn't trade it for anything. <laughs> <laughs> because just, you feel better. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. it just it makes all the difference in the world. You know, mm -hmm. it just gives you more energy and more alertness. Okay, mm -hmm. was there any uh, concern you've you mentioned as a teenager having the uh, the one complication? Uh, the uh, place on your leg that didn't heal. Any other uh, complications that? Yeah, sometime. Oh, I don't. Maybe my freshman year in in college, I they found some background retinopathy, which is real common after the ten about ten years of the disease, which is about what <laughs> I was a statistic. Um, and that, in addition to uh, the spot on my leg, kind of was a, a little bit of a scare tactic. It made me think, oh geez, you know, it's only going to get worse if I don't really muster up some self-discipline. And yeah, that, it did make me take more responsibility for the disease. 
what I'm hearing all through this then is that you you needed the health professionals to to give you the basic information but it has to be geared very much to to your lifestyle right. and that you don't really make the changes until until you're, you're ready, ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and exactly. so that uh, that your helpers have to be constantly listening for those cues that you mm -hmm. give them and there to to help you when when you're ready yeah and they need to be real open to those um, food jags or um, really obsessive times and excessive times when the when the kid is growing up you know adolescence is a tough time for everyone and diabetes just kind of adds to the problem so they need to be real open to what Cece, it's been good to talk with you today. We really appreciate you sharing these things with us, and I think it'll be valuable to many people. This has been a conversation with Cece Karski, dietitian and diabetic.